Hi everybody, this is Jody with Real Progress in Action, and I'm really excited to have Jeffrey Ginter on the show today. Um, we have uh, just, we've really just started talking, so I'm really excited to get into, into more conversation. Our first conversation was amazing, and we get to share all of the cliff notes with you. So Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, my name is Jeff Ginter. I'm a certified medical assistant, a political activist, a full-time pain in the ass. Uh, and I really hate doing what I do. I love, I, as a medical assistant, I love doing that. I hate being political. Uh, and I spent most of my life avoiding being political uh, with the mistaken belief that it wasn't my place to be political. As a musician, as a, as a father, as a whatever, it wasn't my place. And when 2016 happened, I realized I was wrong. I was dead wrong. It was definitely my place. It is everyone's place. I guarantee you, if you have problems with the way things are run, whether it be education, whether it be healthcare, whether it be the military, it is your responsibility to stand up and be counted to make sure that your point of view is made manifest somehow. Uh, because everything that we have going on around us that we don't like, as far as I'm concerned, is our direct responsibility to change because it was our direct fault for allowing it to happen in the first place. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that politics in a democratic society should not be complicated. What politics should simply be about is people coming together, taking a hard look at the problems that we face, listen to different ideas, and then go about solving those problems. Despite what the media may think, politics is not a baseball game with polls. Politics is not a soap opera. What politics is about in a democratic society is people coming together and improving life for our people. I can't be asleep anymore. I have to be engaged. It pisses me off, but I have to be because I have kids, because I have a wife, because I have people that I love, and because I would like to wake up tomorrow morning sometime in the future with a belief that it is getting better as opposed to getting worse. So here I am. So now you all know why I love Jeff so much. <laughs> I think that's amazing. And, and honestly, like, uh, what's that saying? You know, if you're not mad as hell, you're not paying attention. Yeah. And yeah. I think a lot of people kind of woke up right around the same time. You know, even yeah. people who were mildly politically engaged before, that's really when I, you know, lit a fire under my butt. Yeah. You know, so. I mean, it, it really takes sometimes, you know, that type of slap in the face. You know, I... <laughs> There, were, there was nothing more upsetting to me than when that moment hit to suddenly realize all the years that had come before, going back into my teenage years, uh, being politically aware. I'm the youngest of five kids. The, there was politics all the time in my house. We talked about it. Not many of us actually did anything about it, but we were always aware. And that uh, work ethic about being informed stayed with me. I always stayed informed that I realized election night 2016 that I had been yelling at a TV screen for the better part of 47 years, but nothing more than that. I voted, usually with my middle finger, but I voted. Uh, I always knew where things were going wrong. Uh, but again, it wasn't my place, so I said, you know, and to, to realize that I did, in fact, have something to say. And that the only thing I needed was the kick in the pants that 2016 was to make me no longer care if anyone listened. Mm. I had to speak. I had to say something. I had to do my part, however big or small. That's not the point. The point is that you do your part and you let other people decide if it was big or small but you've got to do your part. You must, or we all go down. Yeah. And I'll tell you one thing that really like, um, 
you know, resonates with me about what you said. I mean, I think a lot of it resonates with me. Um, but one thing in particular is, um, you know, you can't, you can't, the way that I put it, um, when I kind of came to this realization is I can't sit around, I would get angry about stuff. And I'd say, yeah. I can't just sit around and complain about it if I'm not doing anything about it. You know exactly. what I mean? If I'm not willing to, to make the changes and, and work towards the changes, then I have yeah. no right to be sitting here talking about it. Because we become responsible. Yeah. I am responsible for Trump directly, you know, not solely responsible, but I am responsible for every decision that those people that had their hands directly on the levers of power, I am directly responsible for allowing them to do what they do. You know, I have a representative uh, right now, Andy Kim, uh, who replaced MacArthur, who I became famous for yelling at at the town hall. And as far as I'm concerned, he's not doing the job. He's, he's doing a job, and I will give him enough credit to, to say that he's doing the job he feels he should do, which is better than MacArthur, but I can go upstairs right now, take a dump, and that would have already accomplished something more substantial than what MacArthur ever did. We're, we've got to set the bar higher. Better than MacArthur, better than Trump is not enough because you can succeed by being just marginally better. And people that are scared, people that are pissed off, people that have not really felt the pain yet, but are starting to realize that there's pain all around, will gravitate towards something that's just marginally better, pat themselves on the back for doing a good job, and then they go home. This is Andy Kim. You know, he is better than marginally better than MacArthur. He is better. But at the historical moment that we're in, if you're not for single-payer health care during a pandemic, you're not sufficient. If you are not actively trying to end all the wars for oil and engaging to make a Green New Deal a reality and a federal job guarantee, under the circumstances that we're in, you are insufficient. I've spoken to this man in numerous times. Over the course of three years, he is still studying healthcare. He is still studying options. He has been telling me for years that he believes in universal coverage. He has been telling me for years that he believes that healthcare is a human right. Three years, and we have answered every one of his concerns. And what it finally comes down to is he's afraid of putting too much power in the hands of the Health and Human Services Commissioner, to which I say, can I swear? Can I swear? Is this a swearing kind of show? They go for it. <laughs> Fuck you, Andy Kim. Be a better congressman. Mm -hmm. If you're afraid of too much power being in the hands of one person, first read the goddamn bill. Congress is the one that sets the parameters, and Congress is the one to whom the Health and Human Services Commissioner must answer to repeatedly. It says so in the bill, in the House bill, numerous times. You know, so he's, as far as I'm concerned, he's dragging his feet, whether by design or whether through fear or I don't know exactly why. And I don't care because I don't have the time to figure that shit out. You don't have time. I don't have time. My family doesn't have time. You're either for these things or you're not. And it's time that we stopped accepting less than we need, which is also less than we can have. Political choices are just that choices. Mm -hmm. And I'm tired of this candy ass, drag your feet, be a nice guy and let that be enough political choices that he's making. I want better for my kids. I voted for better. And this is what I got. So I'm no longer because of him, because of him, I am no longer vote blue, no matter who. Mm -hmm. I know where that leads us to that led us directly to Trump. We all have to raise the bar if incrementalism was ever going to have saved us, wouldn't we have been saved by now? Because that's all that's been on tap for the entirety of my lifetime. I'm going to be 51 next week. So we need better. We need better. And it's not going to happen until we demand it. And I don't mean that in a hyperbolic fashion. I mean demand it. And if they don't deliver, then withdraw your consent. 
I do not consent to be governed by someone like Trump and Pence. I do not consent to be governed by someone like Biden and Harris. I do not consent to be governed by someone like Andy Kim. I will fight for what is better. I will fight for all of it. I will not start in the middle and be allowed myself to be dragged right. I will start way the fuck over there and I will drag you there. <laughs> Well, I also think, you know, I, I, it kind of flows right into what we were um, going to talk about today, because mm -hmm. essentially what happens is we, um, we kind of keep, for every incremental move forward, there are influences behind the scenes who are moving us backwards and backwards. So like every time we get a little bit, we think on the surface that we get a little bit farther, sure. um, we're, we're, um, but behind the scenes, we're getting farther and farther back, right? Um, so, and, you know, of course, what we want to talk about today is poverty. I mean, that, that's essentially what's happened. Look at what has happened since the 1980s. I did, um, I actually was volunteering with um, Justice Democrats for a little while, and I was on their research mm -hmm. team. And I was doing onboarding of new, new volunteers, and this one guy came on, and he's like an analyst. Um, I think he said he was like a CIA analyst or something like that back oh, in the day. Wonderful. So he loves the numbers and all that kind of stuff. And so he's talking about, yeah, if you really look at um, what's happened, um, the way that the wealth gap has expanded, the way that our expenses have um, gone up and up and up. Um, and then in our wages, the, um, the average wage, the minimum wage, pretty close, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the average wage and the minimum wage have stayed like flatlined and whatever. So I actually did my own little research projects. I like that too, right? So I looked up the census data since 1970, right? Because yeah. he said he said in the 80s with Reagan, right? And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, cool. Well, I'll go back one decade and just, you know, to be clear. Sure. I wish I could find it. I made an info, one of those uh, infographics out of it, you know, whatever with the, with the thing. Um, but it's really interesting to see, you know, so what I took into consideration was um, the cost of healthcare, um, mm -hmm. the cost of um, the average cost of a home. Um, the average cost of uh, secondary education, you know, and then I, I did those. I think there was one more I can't think of right now, uh, but it was in comparison to the minimum wage and the average wage. And it was just like, here's this flat line, you know, mm -hmm. of our wages and here's healthcare going, fine, you know, housing costs, going, oh, yeah. everything going through the roof. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about, okay, um, you know, um, adjust that for inflation and things like that, you know, and they say we should be making like 22 50 an hour, I believe yep. is, is Easy. the number. That's I think, yeah. Yeah, it was 22 or 23, you know, yeah. is around there is what it should be as a minimum wage, not your average wage. It should be the minimum wage in order to be able to provision for yourself the things right. that we have deemed are necessary. We're talking about clothing. We're talking about housing. We're talking about health care. We're talking about transportation and food. You know, all these things that we need as a bare minimum in order to be able to make it and not have to go into debt, to not have to have the burden crushing, you know, burden of debt, uh, mm -hmm. you need to be making about, as a single person, by, by, by the way, 22 to $23 an hour. And that's insane when you look at where the minimum wage is now, when you look at what the median wage uh, of most Americans is. Uh, I think it was in 2018, the median wage was about $33,000 a year. $33,000. That means that, yes, okay, fine, half the country is making more than that, it's kind of uh, you know spread out, you know, when you realize that yes, the top one percent are making a lot more, you know, but half the country is making thirty three thousand dollars or less. Half the fucking country in the richest country in the world, and I'm not talking about financial wealth. I am talking about resource wealth. I am talking about the ability to provide housing for everyone health care for everyone, education of the highest quality for everyone. We have the ability to do it because we have the resources in manual labor, in technology, in raw materials. We got it in greater abundance than anywhere else in the world. And half of us are living off $33,000 or less. We are living in, yeah, thank you. We are living, I know, and we've got kids and we've got all manner of, of, of bills and debts, and it's crushing us. You know, we constantly, and you know, if you ever listen to the work of Fidel Kaboob, you know, you'll hear this all the time. We are constantly celebrating gross domestic product, GDP, the totality 
of all sales in US dollars in the country. And if we push that higher, they will never on mainstream media or any real media out there, except for the people like us, will never, well, they will always celebrate any increase in GDP, no matter what contributed to it. So if you're paying more in rent, that's technically more GDP. If they can poison a river, you know, uh, and all the economic activity that goes into that, that is positive GDP. You get poisoned by that river and all your health care costs are now contributing to GDP positively. So when you watch CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, all these people, and they say, well, GDP rose 3%, how much of that was dedicated towards making our lives miserable? Yeah. And how much of it actually did anything, if anything, to make us better? Yeah. So we have, instead of GDP, we have genuine progress indicator, GPI. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a um, Phil Lawn over in Australia, you know, is championing this. And what they do with this is they take a look at GDP and they extrapolate all the data that goes towards pollution, that goes towards devastation, that goes towards all the things that do in fact make our lives more miserable. And they maintain all the things that are part of the economic activity that do in fact make our lives better. So instead of GDP going up, you know, and up, which it has been doing since the dawn of time, you know, the actual progress indicator is flat. All this money that we're spending increasingly, 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 and celebrating is making us sick, is making us miserable, is literally choking the life out of us, while all the things that are making our lives better aren't actually making our lives any better. It's just flat, yeah. you know, which is a wonderful metaphor because it's flatlined. We're dying because we're paying to make it that way. You know, right. that I bend over backwards to be able to earn, to be able to provide for my family. And I'm handing it over to you, whether it's my personal vice of sh enough sugar to kill a horse uh, <laughs> or you for smoking or for anyone else that we all have our vices. We all have these things that we are doing to try to make life just a little bit more bearable. You know, we know we're doing harm to ourselves. We know we're handing money over to people that are just quite happy to watch us die. Uh, but we, we can't stop. You know? And we've got to stop. We've got to stop all of it. You know, I and think, rethink what we can do. Yeah. And I, you know, especially, you know, I think, I think the reason why um, people had this kind of turning point in 2015, 2016, and really like this wake up moment, um, at least for myself, um, it was, of course, you know, with Bernie and yep. all that kind of stuff that really got me active. And the, and the thing about it was, was that he, um, what he was talking about was wealth and equality. What he was mm -hmm. talking about was these kind of issues and framing things in an economic perspective that I hadn't necessarily done before, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when I looked around and I thought, wow, all of these things that, that I thought um, I was, it was just me who was looking at these things or it was just me who was suffering from this. It was just me oh. who was having to deal with this endlessly um, <clears throat> in a variety of different ways. And I think what happened with Bernie was that not only was he bringing economic issues to the forefront, but he was also, um, a, you know, he was, it was like a siren call to like all of us who were like, oh, wait, I'm not the only one. Other no. people are dealing, there's a systemic reason for this yes. and it has to do with the economy and all of these things intersect. And all of that made so much sense because mm -hmm. um, it was kind of putting um, the, the, you know, the thoughts in your head into, um, a, a, a communicable language, you know yes. what I mean? Putting it into a certain framework and a language that you could then be able to express what mm -hmm. you knew was wrong, right? What you knew what was happening and-, and uh... Well, the, 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 the GOP and other like-minded, you know, <laughs> Faustian individuals uh, have been trying to make a narrative, and I shouldn't even say trying, they were quite successful at it, in trying to lay the blame for poverty on individual choices. Right. You know, if you are poor, it's because you're lazy. If you are poor, it is because you made bad choices. If you are poor, it's because you didn't work hard enough. 
which is how they got people to believe that someone, a CEO of a company, could make 500 times more than the average person because they apparently worked 500 times harder. You know, this is where the market, the all-important market, the all-valuable, the all-knowing, the omnipotent market has valued my skills versus yours. Mm -hmm. you know? So society values me and does not value you. This is all fucking lies 100 mm -hmm. lies and i'll tell you exactly how you can figure this thing out if we're talking about individual choices if individual choices are what's going to determine whether or not you succeed or not i would expect such things to be in relatively small numbers because we can't all be lazy we can't all be stupid mm -hmm. we can't all not be working hard people that work three four five jobs are working hard all right. But when we're talking about poverty, 14 percent of the population of the United States lives in poverty. And I'm talking about abject poverty. I'm talking about third world conditions of poverty. Talk about the U.N. came here and said that uh, yeah. the poverty. <laughs> the U.N. Uh, released a report on poverty in the United States. Now, it's a very scathing report, a very damning report uh, that basically said, that the administration and their current policies are basically aimed to crush the poor, to punish the poor. They also said that the United States is one of the world's richest nations and a land of opportunity. However, we are fast becoming a champion of inequality. Now, some of the things that they pointed out in this report uh, noted that Americans born into poverty are more than likely uh, to stay that way. So that ladder of advancement has basically been kicked out from under us. More and more Americans just cannot get out of poverty. And right now, about 40 million Americans live in poverty, according to the census. Now, look, that number is made up of people who work, but don't make enough money to live. I don't remember exactly what they said, but they basically said that, um, you know, we're, we're not doing okay. Yeah, we're not. You know, the next... 50 to 60% of the population, okay, so now we're talking well over half the population are one bad paycheck away from falling into poverty. Yeah. And as anyone that has experienced this type of economic desperation or God forbid living in poverty will tell you that once you start that slide down, that's where you go. They have greased the wheels. Whew. Down you go and down you will stay. Your ability to get out of poverty is limited. So when we're talking about more than half the country are poor, mm -hmm. more than half the country are living in poverty, over half the country can't afford a $500 emergency, they don't have health insurance, they need to get an ambulance ride that's going to cost them one to $8,000 just for the ambulance ride, and they can't afford four to $500, we are talking about a systemic problem not an individual problem. It's, it's statistically impossible for it to be an individual outcome. It is systemic, which yeah. means it's by design. It may be by design getting out of everyone's control who originally designed it. I'll give you that, but I don't care. You've got to stop the system and redesign it. I'll work out what your motives might have been after we've saved everyone. Mm -hmm. We're not going to take the time to separate you between villains and hapless heroes. Y'all can fuck off. Go away. You are responsible for this. You are not to be trusted to get us out of this. Mm -hmm. We are smart enough. We can get ourselves out of this, but we need to get our hands either directly on those levers of power or know what it takes to force those who do have their hands on the levers of power directly to do what you need them to do. Mm -hmm. It's one or the other, but we got to do one or the other now. Well, I think it's really interesting. I, I you know, I, I'm a homeless advocate. I work in a homeless shelter oh. and um, it's amazing to me. And, and a lot of people, when I say this are actually really surprised, but there are a lot of people who are there working minimum wage. And this is in Massachusetts, Massachusetts, the minimum wage is going up every year. Up mm -hmm. until it gets to 15, right? So I, I also make no words. So my 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 pay goes up every time. That, anyway, um, but I live in New Hampshire, so apparently that makes it. You know, that's how I can pay for it. But um, the thing is, is that people who are living in the shelter, they're you know, okay. So first of all, it takes a lot to qualify to be in the. Oh shelter. yeah. You can't just be in there 
Um, if you just, you know, whatever you have to prove on paper, uh, sometimes, you know, like if you have a car, you have to sell your car, like you have to prove on paper that, that you cannot afford to get by, that there's no other way. Which um, is really work. fun to go through. I'm sure. Right. Oh my God. It's yes. It's awesome. Yeah. And, um, uh, but there are people who are living there who are working minimum wage. Mm -hmm. who are living, you know, working 40 hours a week. So they're not lazy. They're yeah. not whatever. And of course, working in a homeless shelter, you catch some kind of interesting perspectives. And, uh, you know, there are assumptions and there are judgments that are made about people purely based on, on their, their financial situation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Purely based on their financial situation. And imagine being in that situation where you are constantly being judged um, as if you have some type of moral failing mm -hmm. um, because you um, don't have the same financial situation as someone else. You know, yeah. I mean, just, you know, and of course, so many things other, uh, so many other things stem from that, you know? Yeah. I mean, like God knows. Just imagine it, in, in many respects, it's like high school all over again. You know, yeah. you're being judged, you know, you, you know, your peers are coming for you, you know, and you'll wind up acting out in all manner of ways. So if you are actually living in that situation and you know society is looking down upon you, you know, judging you harshly, just waiting for an opportunity to squash you like a bug, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? You know, how many people are going to have, you know, the wherewithal to just walk the straight and narrow as it, as it were? How many people are not going to need a little Novocaine at, at night, you know, to be able to help them out? You know, it's, it is fucking disgusting, you know, how we speak about people that live in, in this situation. It is disgusting how we treat them. It is disgusting how we use means testing, uh, which for anyone who doesn't know what that is, means testing is what we're just kind of talking about, where you have to prove that you are poor. I mean, you have to prove that you're poor enough, you know, to be able to get, you know, these handouts. You know, it is absolutely insulting. You know, it is demoralizing and you don't have the resources to do it. Corporations, for example, you know, when you say that, you know, everyone's going to get X amount of money, you know, up to a certain point, which means it's basically means testing. Corporations have entire armies of lawyers and accountants to be able to work all that shit out. They don't have to lift a finger that they weren't doing already. Everyone else on top of a full-time job, on top of their kids, on top of their landlord banging on the door, on top of the neighbor's noise and the downstairs neighbor's noise, on top of all the distractions, have to carve out eight hours a day just to be able to work through the goddamn red tape. Uh-huh. So, I used to say it was a full-time job sticking on, uh, what was it, Medi-Cal or Medicaid yeah. or whatever. It's insane. I'm like, I don't know how to keep this up because apparently something always comes up that I miss something or blah, blah, blah. See, really, it, it is a full-time job. It's Which is why people fall through the cracks. You know, yeah. There's not enough services to help them. You know, the gap between how poor you have to be you know, to qualify leaves a huge amount of gap of people oh, yeah. who are still just suffering you know, mm -hmm. but can't even qualify. You know, <laughs> they'll have to just fall all the way to the bottom. You know, which already says so much about our society mm -hmm. that you have to hit rock bottom before right. we'll even consider the idea of helping you out at all. And yeah. while we do so, we'll be looking down at you and making jokes at your expense and, you know, demoralizing you as much as we can, rubbing your noses in your bad decisions, not the systemic you know, problems, mm -hmm. your bad decisions. We are, as a people, especially in this country, sorry to say, disgusting. We mm -hmm. don't have to be. It's a choice. You know, if you want America to be number one, if that's your goal, look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Start right there. What is number one to you? And if number one to you is I'm number one because I'm fucking awesome, I'm rock awesome, already right there, I'm sorry, you're a dick. <laughs> number one and if you want the nation to follow your example then the nation is going to be a nation of dicks yeah and that by definition cannot <laughs> be number one i have a dick it's disgusting <laughs> it's horrible you know don't aspire to be a dick mm. be a human being be an absolutely empathetic human being and if you can't understand how someone 
makes the choices that they do, if you think it's their choices that get them there and you're just scratching your head, why would you do that? Why would you make that choice? Well, fucking find out before you start making a judgment about why they made that choice. I say that for those people that consider you know, poverty to be an individual problem. I say that for anyone that makes a vote for, you know, wants to vote for Joe Biden and can't understand why other people really don't want to. And you think it's their, uh, that it's their fault if we get Donald Trump as opposed to Joe Biden's fault for not actually giving a shit enough about people to actually give them the programs that they need or make the case why he is what you want as opposed to simply being the only mechanism we have to get rid of Trump, as mm-hmm. if that would fix anything. Mm-hmm. You have to question the motives. You have to understand. That means you have to give a shit. And that's one of the hardest things for people to do in this country, giving a shit. Yeah. And let me also tell you that in order to win this election, it goes without saying that we need a strong grassroots movement, an unprecedented grassroots movement. But let me say this to you also, and this is something that no other candidate will tell you, and that is that nobody in the White House, no matter how good he or she may be, can address the major issues facing working families and the middle class without an active, politically conscious grassroots movement. And the reason for that, the reason for that is not complicated. It is that the big money interests, Wall Street, corporate America, all of these guys have so much power that no president can defeat them unless there is an organized grassroots movement making them an offer they can't refuse.